Good morning. Today's Friday. We've got some spraying to do and um, hopefully some anhydrous to put on. So um, I'm working on some stuff. We're going to spray some of those foliar products out today as well as that last um, pass of fungicide. So I'm working on trying to figure out what exactly we're going to put on and where and what I can mix and what I can't and should and shouldn't and how to keep it all straight and separate and where exactly it's going to go. So uh, as soon as I get this stuff figured out, we're going to run down and get that pallet of stuff out of my seed warehouse and then start loading the sprayer up. All right, well, I went and got that pallet and sorted through it. That, five jugs, and these three boxes, not jugs, are uh, what we're going to spray today. The rest of this stuff is for later in the season, um, mostly for beans and once we get to reproductive stages. All right, I'm getting the sprayer loaded up here. The first load we're going to do is a load of fungicide, the same stuff we sprayed on Monday, Tuesday, whatever day that was earlier this week. Um, we're doing a, a, big, a big load, 106 acres, so we need a full tank and we're gonna spray that out. After we get that done, we're gonna start spraying this stuff. So this is a product, it's from this Ag Explorer company, and it's called Corn Science, and again, I hate their marketing, cause, uh, just, yeah, it, uh, well, uh, it's, it's bad. But, what we have here is a 000 product, which is, oh gosh, so what that means is there is no nitrogen, there is no phosphorus, there is no potassium. But what we are getting is 9% sulfur, half a percent boron, a quarter of a percent zinc, uh, copper, and 3% zinc. Now, here is my theory. So when our corn gets to that stage right there where it is growing rapidly, if you saw yesterday's video, we've got a little bit of striping out there, and it basically can't take the nutrients up fast enough. So if I can put a little bit of sulfur out there and get it on the plant tissue where it's going to absorb it right into the leaf tissue, maybe we can help that and maybe we can make a little bit of a difference. And so that's my theory. Uh, we have 50 acres worth of product here. You put two quarts of the acre on, so I've got 25 gallons. So we aren't going whole hog wild on this and spraying a bunch of it. We're just trying some. Um, the product weighs 10 pounds per gallon, so at 9%, you're getting 9 tenths of a pound of sulfur per acre. That is minimal. It's not very much. You're getting even less of everything else, but you don't need it very much. And so, um, I don't know. We're going to try it. I am not entirely convinced that it's going to do anything, but here's the thing, right? So corn right now is over $5. 550 that we can sell new crop corn for and so for what that product is costing me somewhere around ten dollars an acre two it takes two bushel increase to pay for it three i guess if you want to pay for the sprayer pass so three bushels is not a huge gain so any increase is going to benefit us and it's not like when corn was three dollars or 350 and it would take five, six, seven bushel difference to make a di to pay and to return our investment on it. So it makes you a little more willing to try some of this stuff. Now, if we do use this and have good success with it, and it's something we want to keep using in the future, uh, it'll get combined with the fungicide application or some other pass. So we're not making a separate trip just for that product. But um, this year we're testing it, and so for me to keep stuff straight, we're gonna do it as a separate pass. Okay, we're ready to start spraying, and we're gonna do this field right here, south of the barn. This is where my plot is. Um, so this strip right here is towards the back end of my plot. Um, the variety trials are that way, and then we did a starter rate trial, and then we did a nitrogen rate trial, and then I've got a fungicide trial over here. So that next strip pass over there is going to be my v5 fungicide the one directly outside of what my boom is going to hit will be our no v5 fungicide application trial so we're gonna we're gonna go down along this way but then we're gonna spray across the rows like dad did when he sprayed the uh, uh, herbicide on here in order to 
keep everything fair so there's not wheel tracks in one entry versus another one. So this is kind of going to be our end rows, I guess you would say. It's different spraying across the rows. Definitely some differences in the hybrids and the color and the fullness of them and stuff. Interesting to see. I need to clean that bird poop off the window. It gets me every time I look out there, I think I got a leak and something blowing out. Looks like Dad is uh, organizing. Maybe just relocating his log pile. Taking them from over there putting them over there <laughs> all right next field so this is our nitrogen plot we're starting on the east side of it and we're gonna work that way and uh, I just want to make sure that we cover the whole thing that's why I'm starting on the edge of that plot I'm gonna come back with one of those other foliar products and do some of the rows over here but it's gonna be a separate trial so we're not gonna overlap them and we're gonna leave a strip or two in the middle there so that we can have somewhat of a relevant comparison I had Picked the field with the tile lines across the rows, didn't we? Chase! Alright, so I am about done with this field here. We're uh, going to make uh, one more round, it looks like. Um, I wanted to address something that you guys brought up after the last time I was out spraying this fungicide on, and that is, uh, I told you I don't really do the perimeter of the field. I don't spray the end rows, and I try not to go along trees and stuff like that. And I got a couple of comments and stuff about well, isn't that just allowing somewhere for the fungus and the disease to, to grow and reproduce and cause more problems and stuff? And, uh, you know, it's impacting the productivity of those acres in the long term. And while both of those things may be true, probably are true, um, this V5 fungicide application on corn... Up until a year ago, I wasn't entirely convinced that it was worth it at all or that it paid. And the fact that I'm doing not quite half of our acres instead of all of our acres should tell you that I'm still not quite convinced that it's entirely worth it. Um, but what I do know is that the center of the field is our productive ground, right? End rows and trees, fence rows. They're not the highly productive areas in the field. They're not the areas in the field where we're gonna to expect to see big yields, high increases, or any kind of real return from spraying this fungicide. And so the fungicide itself is not really increasing our yield. It's not making new bushels. What it's doing is protecting the potential that this plant already has, right? Because we're, we're keeping any disease out of it. We're keeping it from reducing our yield anymore um, and so where we turn around and we have compaction on our end rows or the trees are shading the ground and stealing the water and the nutrients or the wildlife are coming out of the trees and stealing all of the or eating the plants anyway it's it's just not worth it to spray something out there to protect a yield that's not there and so that's why we don't and I don't worry about spraying end rows and all of that stuff I may be wrong for doing it that way. I'm sure that the people that spray fungicide religiously on all of their stuff would tell me that I'm, that's the wrong way to look at it, but that's my theory and so that's what I'm going with. Now when we are spraying something like a herbicide and if it doesn't get sprayed, you're going to see weeds anywhere that you don't hit, then it's more crit critical and important to make sure that you spray every acre, end rows or not. So. I don't know. That's my theory. Right or wrong, it's, it's how I've done it. Okay, we're back and loading up again. We're going to put this corn science product in. The use rate on this is two quarts to the acre. So 25 gallons will do 50 acres. We're going to spray 15 gallons of water to the acre, so we need 750 gallons total. And we got to get to mixing. Well then, looks like... Uh, Light blue. Actually, it looks like Miracle Grow. <laughs> Mixed in your water. Just a little blue tinge to it, but it's pretty fluid. I don't know. Okay, we are heading off to the next field, which is really the second field that we sprayed with that last load, but we're going to do a different area of the field with this product instead of the fungicide. So, this is that corn science uh, foliar. 
Um, we've only got enough for 50 acres, like I said, so we don't have a lot of this to do. We're gonna split it between two fields and uh, we're gonna go back over to this one and just spray 20 to 25 acres, whatever an even round equals. And then we're gonna come back here. We're gonna go to this field right behind the barn where the corn looks super fantastic, awesome. We're gonna dump this jug in, which is the value pack. It's another foliar, different uh, stuff in it. And then uh, neighbor, this sprayer. And then um, uh, spray that on there. So we're gonna put both products on that. Then I've got more of that value pack we'll spray on uh, some corn by itself. And then we're gonna do a little bit of that on some beans as well. So the sprayer's gonna be moving all day today because as soon as I'm done, dad's got beans to spray for herbicide. So lots to do, keep moving. All right, I am back in this field right behind the buildings here. I have basically decided this is some of our best looking corn and I'm gonna push the heck out of it. So uh, pretty much if there's something I'm putting on a corn to make it better, I'm gonna put it on this field. So we've got our, uh, I threw that jug of value pack in and oh gosh, stay on the rows. If I run over the corn, it's gonna negate all of the positive effects. Okay, better. Anyway, we're gonna push this corn and see how good a corn we can grow and uh, without water. That's the, that's the thing, I don't have water here, but uh, I don't know, it looks really good. So hopefully this will just give it a little kickstart as we go through this rapid growth phase. I got out for my Instagram photo and dang, look at this corn. That's above knee height. That is so nice. Beautiful. Looks great. Well, this value pack stuff has got a little more color to it. Pretty dark. Makes you think you're getting something. Back to spraying. We picked up a rider. He was pulling in right as I was getting ready to leave, so. Um, we're gonna do 50-ish acres in this field of corn, and then we're gonna go do another field with what's on here. We had enough for 80, so we'll spray that out, and then we got two more loads, another full load, 80 acres, and then we'll have a half load to a little bit 40 acres. So we'll, uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out and how far, where are we gonna go with everything, but I also got my GoPro out. So assuming that I get some decent footage and I remember to take it home so I can get it off the camera today, Here's a sprayer GoPro montage. Have, enjoy. Some of this corn looks really good and some of it is definitely struggling. You can definitely tell the up and down the slopes and the good ground versus the poorer ground. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see whether this foliar does anything or not, adds anything. I mean, it'd be awesome if when I come back a week from now I can see all the strips in the fields because they're nice and dark and green and six inches taller, but something tells me that's not gonna happen. But anyway, we're sitting right at 50 acres covered in this field, so we're gonna pull out of here and go find a bean field to spray some on. Yeah. Well, we're spraying some beans here, putting this stuff on, and I'm not really a big fan of stuff that goes on multiple crops like this when it comes to foliar feeds, but we'll try it. We'll see what happens. So, um, our beans are nice and clean. That's good. They look, they look really good here, so. We're only gonna do about 30 or 40 acres and then uh, we'll be out of product here.
then just start tapping it and stop. Just tap it so that it comes in gentle, nice and slow, nice and slow, nice and slow. Okay, now the other side. Easy, easy. Okay, pull them in tight. Okay, let your foot off the button and go Flip. down, set it in the cradle. How far down? There, until it stops. Fueling. Okay, well, we're about empty. This is gonna be the last pass I do in the cornfield. So I've got two and a half gallons of this stuff left. We're gonna go mix that up and spray it on some more beans and try that. Um, and then we're gonna go finish side dressing like we've been trying to do for three days, but it is already after two So we've been spraying for a long time, but by the time we're done, we're gonna have 350 almost 400 acres covered. So we're, we're doing a lot Beans sure are a lot less stressful than spraying corn. I don't I, I'm gonna run beans over doing this So it's not a big deal You just hit the auto steer button and hope you're in the same tracks as the ones dad made the first time he sprayed it that are the same tracks we'll use the next time he sprays it and the same tracks we'll use when we spray the fungicide in a month and a half. So, uh, yeah, you can see we've got a few patches of some thistles out here. That's Dad should clean them up pretty well when he sprays with the uh, Roundup and herbicides that we're going to put on here. Maybe next week. End of next week, I think we're going to get started spraying. You guys remember earlier this spring when I was complaining about people driving across our fields? Somebody drove across this field after we planted it, came around those trees. And when we get on the right angle here, I'll show you exactly where their tracks are. Because you can see them. Right there. And there. So now that I'm done with the sprayer, uh, Dad is going to do some spraying. Really, this is for a neighbor. Um, we've got some beans to be sprayed. They're going to use this dual magnum, which is a residual herbicide, uh, S. Metaclor, and some Enlist 1, which is a 2,4-D for Enlist beans, and going to throw some uh, glyphosate in there. But before he goes, I need to transfer data, so I want to get the data off that we've got, and I want to reload some other stuff that I have all those uh, fields for the neighbor in there, I think. I just don't have them on that display, so I'm going to do that. It is hot in here. The AC does not work in this truck, and the windows are up sitting in the sun. All right, we are headed to the field to finish side dressing. Finish. Dang it. Hopefully it's drier than it was yesterday. It's got to be drier than it was yesterday. It's hot and sunny today. Uh, but we'll see. Hopefully we can do this. Uh, Brock's coming with me because as soon as I get an empty tank, he can take this truck and the empty tank and get it returned to the fertilizer plant. And then I should be just about wrapping it up and done by the time he gets back from that. And he can take the second tank back. Oh, look at this. Much, much better. We'll be able to go here, no problem. 27 acres, let's get it done and knock all the mud off of this thing that we collected. Know. Yeah. I don't think it was me. Uh huh. It's just the bar, not the tractor. Really? Look at the tires. That's on the tires. That'll fall off as soon as I start it up. All right. Well, we're moving here and uh, it's dry enough. Everything is good. We're going to get this done, no problem. Uh, we've got crooked rows because I didn't have auto steer when I planted this, which means we're hand driving everything now because the auto steer wouldn't do me much good. And uh, yeah, I am ready to be done with in crop work on corn because I'm tired of driving and following rows. This is less stressful than with the sprayer, but still, let's uh, let's be done. Also, this is the biggest corn we've been in side dressing this year, like. Uh, I mean, we got plenty of, we could we could be in taller corn if we needed to be, but anything I run over here is dead. It isn't popping back up like when I first start and the corn is small and I run it over and it might live through it. So, um, yeah, it's uh, we got to get this done. It's time to be done. Last tank change of the year. Yay! Here it is. We're making the last pass. Side dress 2020. 2021. What year is it? I forgot. There it is. Last pass. Um, okay. So we're going to take this tank back to the farm. When we get there, um, I have a couple of things about this bar I want to talk about. One, I want to give you my reviews on it and what I thought of it and everything since it's a different style than what we've run in the past and I've had a few people ask me about it. And two, I want to go over how it works a little bit closer. I, I kind of neglected to do that earlier in the year and I should have. So we're going to do those things. 
honey. I got the anhydrous done and the spraying. I can go on vacation tomorrow. It will be okay. Okay, so let's talk about what this is and how it works first, and then we'll get into my opinions of it. So this is a John Deere 2510H high speed and well applicator. Uh, we have it set up for anhydrous. You can also get them set up for dry or liquid, I believe, or a combination of those three different things. So if you wanted to put dry fertilizer on and anhydrous, you could do it with this machine. Um, anyway, so it is obviously ours is uh, three point mounted. It's really two point with the gauge wheels in the back or the, the caster wheels there. Uh, so it's mounted to the tractor. And uh, this one is a 15 shank. They also have 11 and 23 row, if you can believe that. Um, but anyway, it is very different than our shank style, uh, knife style anhydrous applicator that we ran last year. And um, if you go back and watch my videos from last year, you can see that one a little bit closer. But uh, basically this one has a disc blade. Uh, let me go around where we can see one a little bit easier underneath that's oriented correctly uh, but it has a disc blade here and that blade runs on just a little bit of an angle and then this boot kind of creates a pocket behind the blade for the anhydrous to come out which comes out of that tube right there and it injects it into the ground as we're going through and then um so this piece here is what i call a boot uh, i think deer refers to it as a scraper but whatever this piece that attaches to that, that is pretty substantially worn, uh, this is what we call the beaver tail. And I think it's obvious why. And its job is to kind of break the soil along that trench to help create pockets for that anhydrous to permeate through and bind to that soil. And then these are our closing wheels. And they just press dirt right down on top of it to keep that all that liquid and gas trapped in the soil. So that's how it works. We have an adjustment uh, over on the other side here. There's this gauge wheel that kind of sets your depth. So that runs on the dirt. And then however far the blade sticks below that is how deep you can go. Now with new hardware on here, you're supposed to be able to put anhydrous four and a half inches deep. With our shank bar, we would put anhydrous six to eight inches deep. So we're definitely shallower. But the only reason I ran the shank bar that deep was to get it to seal and stay in the ground. I don't really want my nitrogen to be six to eight inches deep. Nitrogen is mobile within the soil. It's going to move with the water. And so when we get rain, it's just going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And I would prefer, bugs, I would prefer it stay up in the root zone, up towards the top. So putting it on shallower is not a bad thing if we can keep it in the ground, which this bar does very well. So uh, there is a depth adjustment here that moves that gauge wheel up and down to put it in uh, shallower or deeper we pretty much run it as deep as it will go um, I don't know that we needed to but that's where we had it set uh, there's also a adjustment on the pressure that you put on these closing wheels in that arm um, so you can change that a little bit so you'll notice that this entire uh, bar up there that rock shaft is what turns to lower these openers into the ground you then have this big spring um, that kind of adds down pressure to the unit to keep it in the ground. High speeds and hard ground make these very difficult to get in the ground, which is why we have all that weight hanging back there, because you need weight on the bar to press those into the soil. Um, so, how does it work? Well, pretty darn well. I was really impressed with it. Uh, we had demoed one last year, and I kind of knew about what it would do. That's why we took the chance and bought this one. I thought it worked extremely well. Now we did have trouble with that row. The ones behind the outside duels were the ones that gave us the most trouble as far as sealing and keeping the anhydrous in the ground. But you have that with a shank bar too. It's not any different. There's nothing new uh, with that. So all of the other rows except for row one, you guys saw, we had a little bit of trouble with that because there was some, uh, that closing wheel arm was tweaked a little bit and bent. But other than that, everything worked really really well like i thought it was better than the shank style bar that we ran last year 
One thing to note is the amount of wear that we get on this stuff. So this stuff is all running through the dirt and it is it, it wears a lot. Um, so about a third of the way through anhydrous, when we were rained out for a couple of days there, we replaced the boots, blades, and beaver tail on these four rows behind the tires. And I know I don't have a new one for you to compare to, but look at that beaver tail and that beaver tail compared to ones that only have about two or 300 acres on them. Right there, right there. Uh, that one maybe even less. Uh, there is a significant amount wore off the sides of them. Those wear a lot. All of them were brand new when we started the year and all of them have been replaced. And um, that may be a twice a year wear item uh, uh, for us moving forward in the future. The other thing, we did not realize how much wear was on the blades or the boots when we bought it. Um, not that it was terrible or did a bad job, but when we replaced those ones behind the main tires to try and make it do a little better job, uh, we quickly realized that we had worn probably two and a half inches off of these blades, an inch and quarter on each side. Um, so they are, they're worn significantly. Likewise, these boots, this is not supposed to be chipped out here. Um, all of this alongside here, that's not supposed to be missing and gone. In fact, I have a new one of those that I can show you to compare. So here is a new boot. You can see right here is where this beaver tail would bolt on. Um, but look at this tab right here, gone. There's, there's no tab there. Likewise on the other side, it's got this big long ridge. There's, there's no ridge there. And if you look at the, let me lay them on top of each other as close as I can, you kind of look at the thickness in here versus in here. And uh, there is a substantial amount of wear. I mean, look at how this, this one here has got this ridge to it. And there's, there's none of that on that one. So uh, what that means is that all of the blades that have not already been replaced, all of the boots that have not already been replaced are getting replaced. We will have all new hardware on here for next year, except for the ones that we already replaced. We're going to take from the rows that are the hardest to seal, put them out here on these outside rows where it's softer dirt and it works better and it's not as difficult of conditions and let them wear out there, put all new stuff around across the rest of the bar. With the worn blades, it also means we can't get it as deep because that there would probably be material out to here or so uh, with a new one. And so that affects how far into the ground the blade will cut, even if it's set at the maximum depth. So um, I think it will do an even better job with new hardware on it. And like I said, it wasn't bad this year. I was still really impressed with it, thought it did a great job. I just uh, think that there is still room for improvement and putting new hardware on is a big part of that. Now, blades and boots and all of that stuff are not cheap. And so having to replace them frequently is not ideal. Um, but the knives and the shanks on the other bars are not cheap either. And I don't think it's gonna be, I, I'm, I am about 80% confident that these blades and boots are original to the bar. The bar now has over 5,000 acres. I had 3,800 when we bought it. And so um, for that kind of wear and that many acres, that's not horrible. I know that the people that we bought the bar from did not ever replace the blades and they bought it used, but it couldn't have had very many acres on it when they bought it if it had 3,800 when we got it. So uh, I think it's probably going to be at every two to three year thing that we're going to have to replace blades and boots. And like I said, these beaver tails seem to wear more. Uh, we'll probably end up replacing them every year at the least and maybe even once during the middle of the season as well so we'll see we're still learning how it's all goes and works and everything but um for the most part it worked really well we did have that little issue with the flow meter except for it wasn't really the flow meter it was the wiring to the flow meter so we need to get that addressed as well um there are some little tweaks to some of the the plumbing and the anhydrous system that um, we'll make one thing to note there's really three two separate systems on here like you know the bar and the openers are their own system that john deere makes the liquid system is is mostly raven components that that can be broken down into more systems but they're they're two separate things right so the applicator in the 
uh, liquid metering and application system are two very different uh, things that, that they can go together. They don't have to go together. We could put a different liquid system on this bar and it would work just the same, just with the, their different companies' components and stuff. So um, this is mostly Raven. We do have John Blue uh, distributors. This one here distributes to the sections and then on uh, each wing and one in the center there, we've got those I think they call them impella cones that divide it out into each individual row. It's got that Hineker Nitro Alert system on it, uh, which will tell you if a row is is not even with the rest, um, which is is nice to have. But didn't I didn't use it a whole lot this year? Or didn't gain a lot of information from it. So, uh, and then it does Deer Deer Rate Controller. So the computer side of it that's controlling all the valves and everything is another Deer system, and that hooks right in seamlessly with our 2630s and the, the monitors that we're running on everything else. So. Um, but as far as how this works, as far as metering out the, the, the anhydrous, so we've got our hose coming off the tank. There, comes up, and it feeds into here where it splits in two. It goes through these coolers, which um, honestly, I, you can Google this or YouTube it and figure out how they work better than I can tell you. But essentially, there is a what they call a refrigerant line here that is very much like your air conditioner refrigerator cooling that anhydrous down to keep it in a liquid form and because you can't meter a gas very well so we meter it as a liquid um so it goes it comes through here goes through a filter goes through these coolers comes out the bottom where they join back together and then they go through the flow meter that's telling us how much we're applying in a gallons per minute is what it's measuring and then it goes up we've got a pressure and temperature gauge there we have a master on off that controls on off for the whole bar. And then we have another valve here. This is what I call the servo valve. And it opens and closes just a little bit at a time in order to meter that rate. So the flow meter is talking to the rate controller over there, the computer, and that is taking the flow meter reading plus the speed reading from the GPS and saying, all right, at this speed, at this recommended or uh, uh, prescribed rate based on what our maps say, uh, or the rate that I punch it in and tell it that I want it to put on, this valve needs to be open this far. And so it changes that. And as your speed changes, it changes the opening. As the uh, rate changes, it changes the, uh, the amount that that valve is open and everything. Um, and so, so that is what keeps putting the right amount on all the time. So then we come over to here. This is where those refrigerant lines are drawing from. So they're they're pushing a little bit of that back through. Uh, and then we've got these vapor lines that it's all part of making those coolers work. Uh, and then we've got a check valve and then into our distributors, which send it out to uh, each section. The sections then have a master, a section on off valve and then it goes through that valve up into each individual row. We have pressure gauges for each row and uh, yeah, it worked really well, right? So we had some little issues, but you're gonna have little issues, especially with seven, eight year old equipment. So um, there's some things that we can tweak and make it a little bit better for next year. But overall, I'm so impressed with how good of a job that this anhydrous bar does. I absolutely think it did better job than our shank bar did. And I think we can make it do a better job yet. The speed aspect of it alone is incredible. I mean, putting anhydrous on at eight to nine, nine and a half miles an hour is just unbelievable. I didn't really break anything in season. We had some issues, with, like I said, with the flow meter and with some wear on stuff, but nothing broke. I didn't have to stop and change shanks in the field like I did every other year that I've ever put anhydrous on. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. I, I like being able to get across the ground faster than what I was able to do before. And we're really, um, I mean, I got stuff done. And if I didn't have this bar, I'd still be putting anhydrous on and I probably wouldn't be going on vacation tomorrow. So that's good. So any more questions on that bar or anything like that, leave them down below and I will answer them as best I can. All right, so it's uh, quarter to six. Um, I am leaving tomorrow for a week. We're going on vacation with my wife's family, so I'm not gonna be making any videos next week. Like I said yesterday, I may try and do a live stream if I get an opportunity to do so. I may make a video over the course of the week to post for you guys, but we'll see how it goes. So um, I want to go mow the lawn down to my seed warehouse before I go. Otherwise, it'll be real bad when I get back. So I'm going to go work on that and then uh, head home. So thanks for watching, everybody. Um, enjoy your week off and not having to make you know huge time commitment of watching half hour, 45 minute long videos every day. Go catch up on some ones that you missed, maybe. And uh, 
Like I said, if you have questions, comments, leave them down below. Hit that like and subscribe button. Really appreciate you guys watching and hanging out this spring. It feels good to have the spring field work done. Um, you know, when we get back, I've got a little bit of seed stuff that I need to do with picking up some more boxes and stuff. But real quick, it's going to be time to get the combine out. We are going to be two weeks from wheat harvest when I get back. So things don't slow down a whole lot, but maybe for two or three weeks here, we'll get a little bit of a break and then things pick right back up. So thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in a week.